Good morning, everybody. My name is Jens Chapman, and it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you here on June 12th, 2020, to our Spine Journal Club. It's a, a very great privilege to host this. And my first order of business to get out of the way of our great fellows who are going to present three articles and three cases that kind of hopefully will allow us to reflect on what the meaning of uh, scores for metastatic spine disease is. Why is metastatic spine disease so important? It's something that we face a lot here. And it's a very challenging uh, subject because we have more and more patients surviving longer. We have more therapy options available and we're hitting boundary situations to the overall complexity of our lives and nature far more often. So our fellows uh, selected three articles that basically help us try to provide structure to our thoughts and appraisals of spine metastatic tumor cases. We have seven fellows here and six are here and they're gonna present cases and articles. And if I got the sequence right, Dr. Bilal Katana is going to come up first and talk about a scoring system that he selected. And it's going to be followed by Dr. Ben Shell from Texas, who is going to talk about um, a case. So, Bilal. Good morning. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, my name is Dr. Bilal Kotina, one of the Spine Fellows. Okay. 20 to 40% of cancer patients are affected by spinal metastasis. Up to 20% of these patients develop symptomatic spinal cord compression. The magnitude of this problem is expected to grow, especially with the increased survival rate. Treatment goals in patients with spinal metastasis are mainly palliative. So maintenance or recovery of neurologic function and ambulation, effective pain palliation, spinal stability, and local durable tumor control. The NOMS framework consider four aspects of disease status, the neurologic, oncologic, mechanical stability, and systemic status. We assess the neurologic and oncologic in combination. Regarding the neuro neurologic, we have clinical evaluation, the presence of myelopathy or radiculopathy, and radiologic assessment, which is the degree of epidural spinal cord compression. Regarding the degree of epidural spinal cord compression, it is typically based upon axial T2 MRI images at the greatest compression level. We have six-point system, grade zero, osseous disease only, grade 1A, epidural involvement without thecal sac deformation, 1B, fecal sac deformation without cord contact. 1C, fecal sac deformation with cord contact. And then we have grade two and three, where we have cord compression with preservation of some CSF in grade two and no CSF in grade three. Grade zero and one is low-grade epidural spinal cord compression. Patient with low-grade epidural spinal cord compression and mechanically stable spine can be managed by radiation. Patients with high-grade compression, grade two and three, with radio-resistant tumor, they will need surgery before the radiation. Regarding the oncologic, it is the response to available therapies. Radiosensitivity, it is defined as the response to the conventional external beam radiation therapy. There are radiosensitive tumors such as the lymphoma, seminoma, myeloma, breast, and prostate. Most other solid malignancies like sarcoma, melanoma, kidney, thyroid are radio resistant. It's very important to determine the radio sensitivity and radio resistant because it's critical in terms of predicting clinical outcomes. Patients with radio sensitive tumors after radiation have higher probability to maintain their ambulatory function after one year than a patient with radio resistant tumor. Now, patients with radiosensitive tumors, they can manage with external beam radiation regardless of the degree of cord compression if we have mechanical stable spine. But in clinical practice, these patients are usually considered for surgery because in surgery, we achieve immediate decompression of the spinal cord to increase the probability of neurologic recovery and improvement. This is a landmark paper, fair, uh, level one evidence, 2005, we have two cohort of patients. First patient underwent decompressive surgery followed by radiation. The second cohort underwent radiation. And they have solid malignancies, 
solid tumor malignancies with cord compression or and or neuro involvement. They excluded the radiosensitive tumors such as the hematologic malignancies. In the first cohort who underwent surgery followed by radiation, they have significant maintenance of continence, neurologic, and Frankel score and survival time, and this study was stopped. Regarding radio surgery, it is a game changer. It improved local control rate, even for a radio resistant tumor. It allows submillimeter precision, and it is given in high dose, in single fraction or one to three fractions, so better patient compliance than conventional radiation. Now, patients with grade zero or one, no cord compression, SRS can be given as definitive therapy if they have mechanical stable spine. If a patient have grade two or three cord compression with radio resistant tumor, they need surgery before the radiation in order to safely deliver the radiation dose to the tumor without injury to the cord. Separation surgery, it involves circumferential decompression of the spinal cord to allow two millimeter separation between the tumor and the cord in order to deliver safely the radiation dose. Retrospective article, 186 patients underwent separation surgery followed by SRS. And in the conclusion, it is a safe and effective strategy for establishing durable local tumor control, regardless of tumor histology, radiosensitivity, radio resistant. And the only significant factor in this study was the high dose SRS, better than the low dose. Mechanical stability, it is an indication for stabilization, regardless of neurologic or oncologic status, and we have the SIN score. Regarding the systemic disease and comorbidities, it is the ability to tolerate a proposed intervention, which is a function of tumor burden and comorbidities. Clearly, high surgical complication rates are undesirable for a patient with limited life expectancy. We have several scoring systems with questionable reliability because of the new treatment such as the biologic. Regarding the NOMS framework, it is a comprehensive system. At any point in time, it, in, it can incorporate new systemic radiation and surgical treatment option as they become available without changing these for, for sentinel decision points. In conclusion, by consideration of the neurologic, oncologic, mechanical, and systemic, we, it helps us to decide which treatment. Sensitivity to radiation and the grade of dural spinal cord compression can help us to decide for radiation with or without surgery. Mechanical instability is an independent factor for surgery. Systemic disease is the risk-benefit ratio. Surgery still play a major role in patient with mechanically unstable spine or patient with radio-resistant tumor with high-grade epidural spinal cord compression. And SRS is a game changer, which allowed us to do minimal invasive surgeries, separation surgeries, and less morbid surgeries. And thank you very much. All right, just to kind of keep things going before we do the uh, discussion. Uh, I'm Ben Shell, I'm one of the other Spine Fellows. I was in a quick case to kind of highlight some of the uh, discussion points we just presented. This is a 57-year-old male originally presented to us um, back in October. He had a history of no multiple myeloma since a year before, um, underwent an uncomplicated stem cell transplant, but it was not successful a few months prior, and then had slowly worsening back pain that uh, was beginning uh, to kind of um, rear its head in um, October of, <clears throat> of this past year. Uh, then on October 18th, he became acutely weak and incontinent, uh, but stayed at home, thought it would resolve, um, and then presented to our hospital um, on the 21st of October uh, with that exam. Um, and uh, pretty impressive uh, that he stayed home for that amount of time, um, being so weak in his lower extremities. Uh, he then presented with this imaging, uh, which was obtained a week prior. Um, this is uh, showing the compression there at T78. Uh, this is the MRI <clears throat> from uh, his outpatient visit where the um, uh, compression is shown right there as it scrolls through there on the video. So then a week later when he showed up, I, I, at this point he was asymptomatic. Um, he had went home uh, and then had the presentation we just ran through. And then a week later, uh, when he started having more acute symptoms, he went through these, um, these images. 
at our hospital. Let it play through. Basically showing some progression of the disease, but then still a T78. Not total complete CSF effacement, but near complete, especially at the worst level. So at this time, Spine was consulted, which is now two days later, because he was admitted to the hospital. He started on steroids and radiation, which was his uh, originally given plan. He did not improve. <clears throat> Spine was consulted, and uh, an original consult note by us had his um, SIN score here at 11 uh, over here on the right, uh, which was calculated. So then I'll open it up for discussion here as far as what should we do at this point. The the CT scan will scroll through, just give you a better idea of the bony anatomy. So just to kind of review, he has, he's acutely weak in his lower extremities, uh, incontinent of urine, uh, radiation and steroids were not improving his condition. And then uh, I can start on the gnome slide if you wanna show that before we. Let's keep going. Yep, so then, uh, so just kind of review, uh, and then we uh, give him a grade four for the spinal cord compression. Diagnosis of multiple myeloma, um, since score of 11. And then systemic disease at this point, um, when he presented, we didn't have a great idea of, because he had not uh, really fully completed his workup, but due to his acute neurologic compromise, um, we uh, elected to proceed with our treatment plan, which we can uh, show on the next slide. Um, so we took him emergently overnight uh, for a T5 to 10 laminectomy. He was transferred from one of our sister uh, hospitals uh, a couple blocks away. So he got here uh, around eight or 9 p.m. Did T5 to 10 laminectomy uh, with a partial vertebrectomy at that seven, eight level, which was the worst level. Um, and then uh, you can see the final uh, standing films there on the right. And then there's the post-op CT uh, as well, um, stabilizing due to the extent of the bony decompression. So pathology from that and the subsequent workup showed a CNS myel uh, myeloma, um, and the plan was to resume uh, chemotherapy after extensive discussion with the oncologist and uh, his family. The oncologist uh, was very hesitant about doing any type of uh, chemotherapy or further radiation because of the poor prognosis and um, the unlikelihood of an, any kind of meaningful improvement. Um, the uh, Sorry, we'll go through. And then on the further workup, there were found, meds to found in his ribs, chest, and lungs. Um, after an extensive discussion with the oncologist, they started him briefly on chemotherapy. Um, after a few weeks, he did not improve, um, either clinically or radiographically, uh, as there in the exam below. Um, and then he, after six weeks uh, from our original surgery, was transferred to comfort care uh, and then expired a day later. Thank you, Ben. Um, Bilal, uh, can you uh, take this microphone and tell us, according to the NOM score, go back to the uh, neuroimaging slide, your question slide, Ben. Uh, what do you think in terms of the NOM score? This patient had an unfavorable outcome. He was paralyzed. Unfortunately, during the golden period when he presented initially, he, where he had preserved neurology, no surgical consultation was obtained. So where would he fit in the NOM score? prior to being paralyzed, and how would the NOM score help us with this case? The NOM score help us in this case that we have to consider the four major sentinel things, neurologic and oncologic and mechanical and the systemic factors. Regarding the neurology, he, as you said, he was, uh, before, uh, he was neuro intact before. And then regarding the oncology, multiple myeloma, which is known uh, radio sensitive, but in this patient has failure of multiple treatment. And mechanically, he is potentially unstable. And this patient, before receiving the radiation, there are many reports in the literature, patients with grade four compression, they can uh, benefit from immediate decompression and stabilization for their cord. But of course, after discussion with the family and the oncologist regarding the risk-benefit ratio. Uh, Patrick Johnson, I think I saw you on the uh, visitors, um, uh, on the panelists, uh, uh, group, 
Uh, can you hear me, Patrick? Yeah, I can. Uh, uh, good morning, Jens and everybody. It's great to see our friends and colleagues all around the country here. So in LA, this patient uh, unfortunately switched from uh, a reasonably intact, so we surmise, to a pretty much complete, it's, not, it's an incomplete thoracic, but motor complete patient. So he switched from an Asia D probably to an Asia B. Is this a patient who you still would have taken to the operating room or would you have counseled him uh, on palliative care or just symptom control? Well, thank you for asking me. It's a, a real sad case, which interestingly, I, I didn't expect the uh, outcome that we saw uh, fairly quickly because we do see a large number of myeloma patients and uh, you know, this is an unfortunate one. I, I'm kind of questioning how much we should do in patients like this because the thr mid thoracic spine is actually quite stable. I would operate on the patient. I would decompress the patient. I didn't really get to review the imaging, but it looked like the, all the vertebral bodies are pretty intact. Uh, we will operate on these people and decompress them without fusing them. Uh, if we need to at a later point, and of course you can do the operation probably within a very, very short time. Um, and, and I think it's just expedience of, uh, of uh, resources mm -hmm. with uh, what you can do very quickly to decompress a patient. You see if they get better. Uh, you see if it, it's a systemic disease, that's the biggest problem. We're not there to treat a focal tumor or the primary tumor of the spine. And uh, I, I always think about what can I do for the very least? And uh, I can always come back later. And I, I probably would have decompressed the patient with the information I know and not, not fuse or instrument the patient. Yeah, now fair enough. Do you use a score like the NOM score, which is the most comprehensive uh, one available? We do, but uh, you know the mid thoracic spine is it's a different place. I mean, it's something that I look at. My gnome score is look at it like this. I read it and I say, okay, we can decompress this thing, and I don't think it's going to become unstable. You can take out a facet on one side, or the tumor's already taken it out. So I don't think you're going to make it more unstable by doing a uh, narrow laminectomy and taking tumor out and decompressing the spinal cord. So. Uh We'll take this as a segue, maybe, if I take moderator's prerogative, and address the stability issue, because you raised the stability issue that the mid-thoracic spine should be pretty stable. This is a picture of our seven wonderful fellows, and I'm gonna have the next speaker introduce himself, Dr. Freela. Hello, everyone. My name is Sven Freela. I'm one of the research fellows here at the Swedish Neuroscience Institute. I'm originally from Germany, where I'm a resident at the University Hospital Bergmannsheil in Bochum, and I'm happy to present today at our journal club. So I will present the spine and stability in neoplastic score, and subsequently Dr. Gutmannsson will go on and show us um, the score in a case presentation. Um, the Spinal Instability Neoplastic Score was published in Spine in 2010 under the title A Novel Classification for Spinal Instability in Neoplastic D Disease. Metastatic disease of the spine remains a common problem and its incidence is increasing as detection methods and treatments for primary cancer allows patients with active disease um, to have enlarged life expectancy. While all patients with the diagnosis of a primary spine tumor should receive surgical consultation, it is still not completely established as to when patients with metastatic disease of spine should receive um, surgical consultation and intervention. Um, sorry, back. Uh, surgical, uh, the surgical treatment decision um, was ba broadly, broadly based on spinal instability and patient-specific factors as a patient um, health and prognosis as well as um, histology of the tumor. Um, spinal instability was poorly defined in the literature. Moreover, there was a lack of guidelines available to aid defining the degree of spinal instability in the setting of neoplastic spinal disease. Um, especially for non-surgeons, this may be extremely challenging. May be extremely challenging, often leading to under-treatment or um, of the patient or um, um, under treatment of the patient or um, not a referral to surgical um, consultation. A comprehensive classification system for diagnosing neoplastic spinal instability is our, was the aim of the score. There was a lack of guidelines available to aid um, in defining the degree of spinal instability in the setting of neoplastic spinal disease. 
um, especially for non-surgeons and maybe extremely challenging for, um, to identify instability in spinal um, uh, neoplastic diseases, often leading to inappropriate referrals of patients without instability or under treatment of patient with instability risking pain or neurologic deterioration. Therefore, the aim was a comprehensive classification, classification system for diagnosing neoplastic spinal instability. For example, this imaging is showing a spine with diffuse metastatic involvement, approximately 25 um, degree of kyphosis, a new T10 fracture with collapse of the vertebral body greater than 50% and a bilaterally pedicle um, involvement. The most of us would agree that this spine is suspected to be unstable. But, for example, when we look at the next imaging, which shows a metastatic renal cell lesion, also in T10, it can be more challenging to decide if the spine is unstable or not. The Spine Oncology Study Group, which developed the score, is an international group by 30 spine oncology experts. The score is based on a systematic review and a modified Delphi technique. The systematic review fails of defining um, except in, exact instability criteria, but served as framework for which um, to guide an expert consensus on neoplastic spinal instability. They used questionnaires and control feedback forms to identify and rank um, factors for instability. The whole Delphi process is included, including seven steps, which I will shortly present in the following slides. The initial meeting criteria, in the initial meeting criteria deemed important to clinical decision making were identified. 24 members of the group listed factors for the definition of spinal instability. The first round of criteria was further organized and matched with the findings from the systematic reviews. All participants ranked these factors as part of a four-part survey, including clinical and radiographic features, anatomic location, and open-end response. The results were defined, uh, di divided. Sorry, the, the results were divided based on scoring into three groups: highly relevant, over 70, relevant, 40 to 70, and less relevant. The whole scoring system reached from zero to 100 points. After this, a primary spinal stability neoplastic score was developed, followed by a second round questionnaire feedback and comparison between first and second round of ranking. The ZIN score was then applied to a series of representative cases. An open-end feedback was um, held. So, Overall, 40 factors were ranked by the group. Nine factors scored greater than 70 and 19 scored between 40 and 17. The highest ranked factors were subluxation and translation, progression of deformity, facet distraction bilaterally, and character of neurologic changes. The anatomic areas of most concern were the occipital cervical junction and the cervical thoracic junction. After integrating all information, the ZIN scores made up of the following six components. Spine location. This component considers whether the location of the neoplasm is in a typical less stable uh, location. Patients with lesions in junctional regions received three points, while lesions in a ragged um, segment received a score of zero. Mechanical pain. This component considers whether patients have mechanical pain, occasionally pain, or are free of pain. Bone lesion quality. A CT scan is the best modality um, for, de de for defini defining this characteristic. Divided in lutic mix and blastic lesions. Spinal alignment, subluxation or translation denotes the highest contribution for instability in the subsection and throughout the entire um, cumulative score. Vertebral body collapse. Anterior and middle column involvement by a tumor is denoted by this component of scoring system. It's divided in over 50% collapse, under 50% collapse, and no collapse with 50% body involved. And last, posterior lateral involvement of spinal elements, which can be also divided bilaterally and unilateral. So, the minimum score is a zero and the maximum is 18. Scores of zero to six denote stability, scores of seven to 12 denote indeterminate instability, and scores of 13 to 18 denote instability. Patients with a ZIN score of seven to 18 warrant surgical consultation. 
Meanwhile, the, well, uh, the ZIN score is well established and validated by several studies. When we look at the different components for the score location, pain, bone lesion, spinal alignment, and posterior lateral involvement of the spinal elements are well supported by the literature. Involvement of more than 50% of the vertebral body have, has been shown to predict risk of pathologic fracture. Moreover, the risk for burst fractures generally increase with tumor size. However, there is no clear threshold um, identified in the literature. In addition, in case of multiple spine lesions, stability scores are not summed and multi-level uh, spinal diseases are not considered in this score, what may be a limitation. In the end, our key points, spinal instability is a key component in the treatment uh, decision-making for spinal oncologic patients. The score uses a comprehensive set of factors. It aids radiation and medical oncolo oncologists, as well as primary care physicians with respect to timing uh, of referral to spine surgeons of evaluations. And the most, important, the most important part, it's a treatment algorithm for patients with primary and metastatic spine tumors. Thanks very much. Go back to your slides, Sven. Great talk. Thank you. Quick question, and then I have a question for my partner, Amir Abdul-Jabbar, and uh, I'll ask him to unmute himself. So this was an eminence-based scoring system. This is not really evidence-based based upon clinical outcomes. Is that a correct That's assumption? That's correct. Yeah. So 30 eminences were collated and structured. Right. Amir, the, the clinical reality is this was, I think, intended to help oncologists and radiation oncologists to uh, kind of uh, help in their decision making whether they should consult surgeons, such like in that first unfortunate case that we showed. In your clinical experience, do oncologists and radiation oncologists even know of these scores? Uh, so in my experience, it's very rare for them to use one of these scores to consult us. Um, as you mentioned, um, you know, it, it's powerful to have something to kind of justify whether to a patient whether they're at high risk or not. Um, but I think every case is very independent and um, the the way the, the scoring system is designed is obviously it's not by us and um, I think there could be some modifiers. But I do think for me it's the, the best system that we have published out there and able to um, really kind of stratify these people. I think as we mentioned, individual cases um, can really turn your own clinical practice, um, but we have to have some framework, otherwise we're just kind of shooting blindly. Um, we got a great comment by uh, one of our participants, Dr. Schoenfeld, uh, commented um, uh, that uh, the Dana-Farber and the Brigham women's team does use this, so this is welcome news. Thank you, Dr. Schoenfeld. Um, the, uh, the point is a very uh, good one um, and, again, encouraging because we clearly have to intensify our attempts at trying to disseminate what we've created. And to echo Amir's statement again, uh, we can't use this in an insular fashion. We have to spread this and uh, test it probably with other professional groups that we work with. Uh, um, I'm going to talk about Izzy's comment in a second. Dr. Lieberman made the great comment of stability. Is a cement augmentation enough? Uh, uh, and again, we'll come back to that in a second because this case will, I think, pertain to that. So Dr. Goodmanson, uh, yeah. show us a case pertinent to the SIN score. Will do. Hello, Virtual Spine world. I am Dr. Goodmanson. I'm one of the other fellows here. Um, let's uh, go through a case that kind of illustrates the use of this um, and maybe a little bit of controversy as well. This is a 51-year-old female uh, who is presenting complaining about a one, knee, uh, one week of fairly severe neck pain and back pain. The neck pain is worse than the back pain. Uh, it was sudden in onset and not really related to any trauma, but she's not having any numbness, weakness, bowel bladder issues, anything like that, but does endorse some pretty severe muscle spasms throughout her upper uh, back and kind of neck area. Of note, she uh, noted a breast lump in February and there was a mammogram pending to kind of work this up. Oh no, the hackers are back. Why? It's froze. Frozen. It's computers. Frozen too. I like Frozen 1 better, but... Man alive. Um, all right, it's gonna it's gonna skip around probably like six yeah. slides now. Can I borrow your computer? Yeah. Yep, I have it on the USB. Yeah. Hey, Jan, it's Pat Johnson, and uh, while we're getting 
technology uh, back up and running. Can I chime in a little bit? Please, here? please, most welcome. You know, the, uh, I'm familiar with all the studies and the SIN scores, and and you know, um, I I don't think that any oncology people look at those and. Uh, make any determinations whether to consult surgeons. I, I'm not aware of any. Uh, if they are, um, that would be unusual, I think. You know, but this case, if you go back to it, and uh, I, I'm still going to be a little opposed to it, because if you look at it, uh, what are the major factors, okay, of the SIN study, and you total up the numbers for this case, um, is that it's somewhere in the eight or nine range, which is, you could call it indeterminate, but there is no vertebral collapse, there's no vertebral insufficiency, the ALL, the PLL is questionably intact and one of the facet joints. So you have anterior column and middle column, part of one mil middle column is intact. And so, you know, it's an emergency, this was an emergency situation and it's, it's not a spinal cord injury, this is a spinal ischemic problem or compressive problem from tumor. And I still think that when you're faced with these things, is it's always important to, you know, to do the safest thing, obviously. And if you're not sure, go ahead and instrument the patient. As far as doing a formal orthrodesis, I think it's almost never do it in these kind of patients. It's it's not a way, it's not useful at all. And Neil's absolutely right. Just do the least you can do. Do them percutaneously. But I think that particular case, if you if you grind it right down to the numbers of what the SIN score is, it's not going to reach uh, a level of, of really necessitating it. If the surgeon's uncomfortable, go ahead and do it. But use those studies. And I, I think that, as you said, this is an eminent score. You know, these are 30 surgeons who got together and looked at it. Yeah. So it's not much better than our journal club here. You know, there are a bunch of opinions. <laughs> That's uh, well put. And that was actually, you stole my line. I was going to say just that. Uh, we had a lot of discussions about this, but I take full responsibility for instrumenting. And again, honestly, the additional time by the instrumentation was about an hour. But I, I still say whether it's ischemic, compressive, inflammatory, um, or uh, traction induced, uh, this is a, a spinal cord injury, is a spinal cord injury. Uh, you're very spot on in saying that the SIN score has a problem that so many patients are indeterminate, which brings me back to Dr. Goodmanson here. Ryan. All right, we'll resume. I think the hackers have gone away. But quickly, past medical history, nothing crazy. She did have a pretty uh, fair uh, history of alcohol abuse, tobacco abuse, no elicits. On exam, she's completely, uh, essentially normal on exam, uh, and uh, Asia is 100. Uh, CT scan, we can show here. Uh, shows, uh, and it'll be kind of quick, and I'll try and pause it here, but a uh, very large lytic lesion within the uh, C2 body and dens, uh, as well as the posterior elements of C2 and the lamina. Uh, she has some local kyphosis, uh, but uh, nothing uh, really in the rest of the cervical spine that you can see. And if you, if I pause it in the right space, you can see that she does have a fracture, a pathologic fracture through uh, the dens of uh, C2. This is a, a coronal view just to show how large that lesion is uh, and hopefully show the uh, fractured area as well. <clears throat> Here's a T2 weighted MRI uh, showing uh, this lesion as well as a large soft tissue lesion in the posterior elements, uh, which can be seen uh, there as well. I'll skip forward. This is a contrasted study showing the same thing uh, with hyperintense signal within uh, this area. So this is essentially an unknown lesion, but a suspected a metastatic type lesion. So she underwent further imaging. CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis showed a large invading breast mass. Uh, she did have uh, further neuraxial imaging, which showed uh, metastatic lesions throughout the TNL spine. She had a right hip uh, intertrochanteric lesion, uh, which was uh, found to be actually a little bit later, fairly large. So this is a little bit. That's a little post hoc uh, Morel score. Uh, and then a left ischium uh, lytic lesion as well. Um, so on her, uh, we looked at a SIN score on her, and you can see that her SIN score uh, is exactly what we were talking about. It's indeterminate. But as my colleague uh, pointed out before, uh, this is at a high junctional area and a very um, uh, um, susceptible area of instability. And because of this, while this is a high indeterminate score, um, we decided to uh, do a surgical fixation for her um, and decompression as well as to get a biopsy uh, of what this was exactly. So the 
plan was for stage one to do a C2 uh, decompression uh, of the posterior elements with a biopsy of that large lesion within the uh, lamina of C2. Uh, we would do a fusion of C1 to 3, and we would then uh, go on to uh, do a um, C1 to 3 uh, strut graft as well. So this was performed. Uh, everything went very well. Uh, this is a post-operative CT uh, showing good placement as well as um, the uh, um, graft. So the pathology came back, dedifferentiated metastatic, metastatic carcinoma, and eventually the tumor showed a triple positive uh, breast metastasis. Uh, so the second stage, a second stage was planned for her as well then uh, to fill the uh, anterior C2 vertebral body uh, with uh, um, cement uh, in this area. And so this was then accomplished uh, and also went very well. Uh, this was again for a, a structural support of that anterior C2 body uh, due to it being a very large lesion. So in conclusion, this is a uh, patient with C2 metastatic uh, breast ca uh, carcinoma with the sins of 12, a high inter indeterminate uh, score. Um, and our questions being, would have a non-surgical route have been favorable in her? And did the SIN score aid in our decision making uh, for this patient? Um, it was a high indeterminate score, but it's also a high uh, um, propensity for instability. Um, I think that it is a tool, the SIN score overall, because when looking at this patient uh, in uh, um, a larger light, uh, this is something that likely needs fixation uh, and she is going to undergo radiation and chemotherapy and it has a high propensity for falling apart. So we'll do. Let's ask one question and let's have the next speaker, Eric, come up and tee up so we have hopefully no technical problems. Um, Todd, can you hear me? Todd Landman. Um, this is obviously a radiosensitive lesion. We didn't quite know it. The patient was in severe pain, uh, despite a rigid neck collar. Are we crazy to have operated on her? And um, uh, should we have just radiated her and kept her in a collar? Should we have just done the posterior part? We obviously uh, tried to do a very comprehensive solution. Um, what are your thoughts? I don't see it. So you have to unmute yourself. You're still muted. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Try, try your voice. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear, thanks. All right, can you repeat that again? I'm having trouble here. Yeah, so we obviously did a pretty aggressive surgical management of a patient with a radiosensitive lesion, but she has an odontoid fracture. She is very painful despite being in a rigid neck collar. Was this total overkill, um, or uh, uh, is at least one of those surgeries reasonable? What would you have done? Um, I think I would have been pretty aggressive like you, I think. I mean, given their pain levels, would have instrumented us in a similar fashion, probably. Our, our reason for the anterior part was heavily debated um, in our group. Dr. Hart, who's come back again, voted against it. My vote in favor of the cementing was post-radiation. I don't want to do an upper cervical spine exposure anymore, um, if need be. And again, I thought from a stability standpoint, this would offer immediate pain relief and some immediate structural stability. But a highly arguable point, highly controversial. Bob, do you want to comment? Or uh, he, he's saying, no, here, you have to use this microphone. Let me wait for the next case. I, uh, I was following a call of nature while this one was being presented. Well, thanks for that detail. All right, we have Eric and then Cliff. Let's uh, kind of try to stay within a time frame. Thanks, guys. Hi, my name's Eric Heyman. Um, I'm presenting the paper assessing the utility of a clinical prediction score regarding 30-day morbidity and mortality following metastatic spinal surgery, uh, the New England Spinal Metastasis Score. Uh, the lead author on this was Dr. Schoenfield, who understands in, in the audience. So I'm worried that this is going to be an Annie Hall type situation where I present it and he goes, you're an idiot who understands nothing of my work. Um, so let's get started with that. Um, so 
essentially what the study is is a validation of a previously developed uh, score, the New England Spinal Metastasis Score, so-called because it was developed by three Harvard hospitals and uh, one Dartmouth teaching hospital. Um, so it really could be called the Ivy League score, the Harvard score. Um, but nevertheless, it was termed the New England uh, Spinal Metastasis Score. Um, because this is a limited multi-center study, just four centers, um, they, they wanted to extend its, its validation to you know, a large, more national um, scope. Uh, additionally, the focus of the original paper that developed the New England Spinal Metastasis Score was one-year survival, um, which is important counseling patients, but at least from a surgeon perspective, uh, you know, our focus is a little more short-term. You know, the Patchell study focused on three-month survival, um, and as surgeons, we care about complications, you know, things a, a little more short-term, at least, you know, when making the decision to operate or not operate on a patient with a, a spinal cord uh, metastasis. Um, to do this, they use the National Quality Improvement Database, um, this ACS's NSQIP uh, database. Um, this is a large um, pseudo-administrative database. I say pseudo-administrative because it was not, it's not coded by um, you know, people in the billing department, administrators, it's coded by a dedicated research nurse at, at each institution. Um, who, you know, so the quality of the data is a little bit better. Uh, and essentially what it does, it looks at operated patients and tracks their outcomes for, for 30 days, including mortality, readmissions, complications, et cetera. Um, the goal was to see whether they could validate this previously developed score um, using this database. Um, to go over the NESM score itself, um, it consists of three components. Um, the first is the Bauer score. This is a uh, prognostic score developed in the 90s uh, to guide orthopedic surgeons uh, in the treatment of uh, bony metastases. Uh, essentially, it looked at four factors, whether or not the patient has visceral metastases, whether or not they have a lung primary cancer, whether or not their primary cancer is breast, kidney, lymphoma, or myeloma, and whether the lesion that's being valued as a solitary skeletal met or whether they have diffuse skeletal metastases. Um, the idea being to guide um, the surgeon in terms of treatment. Uh, again, a higher score is better here. So if you have, for example, um, diffusely metastatic melanoma, um, that would give you a score of uh, essentially zero and uh, you'd be recommended for supportive care. Um, if you have you know, a single lesion of myeloma uh, in your spine, uh, that would give you a score of four and you'd be considered a candidate for more aggressive uh, type surgery, and in this case, a ventrodorsal decompression, for example. That's the modified Bauer score. This sort of forms the core of the NESM score, which m added two healthiness factors to uh, the modified Bauer score. So uh, first they looked at hypoalbuminemia. Hypoalbuminemia defined as an albumin of uh, Three point, less than 3.5, and whether a patient could ambulate. Um, in the original paper, they said ambulation was either intact or impaired slash absent. Um, each of these quote unquote healthiness states bought you an additional point. Um, they then calibrated the score based on one year survival um, and adopted a score ranging from zero to three. Um, with zero being you know, very poor one-year mortality, um, and then a three being a very high um, probability of one-year survival. Um, you may notice that two plus one plus one doesn't equal three, equals four. The, the reason for this is they found no difference in one-year survival um, between the threes and the fours, so they lumped them together. Um, so there is a ceiling effect. Uh, Again, like I said, the NSQIP uh, um, is a very large data set, I, I think something like you know, several thousand patients per year that collects data uh, over 150 variables, including a variety of preoperative risk factors, uh, risk factors, uh, the preoperative uh, condition, and then follows them out for 30 days with regard to mortality and morbidity. Um, it, it collects a lot of data. It's it's a huge database, um, and like I said, it's inputted by a trained, uh, certified surgical clinical reviewer. Um, so it's the advantage of this database, it's a large database. The disadvantage is it's what you see is what you get. If you have a question about you know, further data, you can't add to it. It's just sort of given to you as a de-anonymized, uh, a de-identified uh, set of data. Um, the reason why I mention this is you know, it, it doesn't, you can't just query it for patients who've had spine surgery for cancer. You have to use um, some tricks. So the way they did this was, uh, they looked for patients who had a CPT code identifying either cervical, thoracic, or lumbar decompression 
and either a primary ICD-9 cancer diagnosis, so if the reason their hospital was cancer and they had spine surgery, or they had a diagnosis of disseminated cancer. Um, I'll get into that in a second. Um, so uh, this algorithm, if you look at, will treat, will select a lot of patients uh, potentially who may not have undergone, could potentially select patients who may not have undergone spinal surgery for cancer. For example, um, based on my understanding of methodology, a patient with an epidural abscess who had um, completed chemotherapy for myeloma in the past year would have a diagnosis of disseminated cancer and would be counted as a surgery for spinal um, cancer by this methodology, even though they weren't having surgery for cancer. Um, the other question, obviously, how do you build a Bauer score? If you look at the Bauer score, it has a lot of specific things, whether they have visceral metastases, whether they have a solitary skeletal metastases. And the authors acknowledge that they can't directly derive the Bauer score from the ICD, from the, uh, uh, from the data in the NSQIP. Um, to do this, they, they looked at a combination. So if a patient had a primary diagnosis of lung cancer, um, they'd be given a modified Bauer score of one and get zero points in NESM. Um, if they had a uh, diagnosis of either breast, kidney, lymphoma, or myeloma, and no disseminated cancer, which is a separate criteria um, employed in SQIP, um, they'd be given a score of three to four, two points in NESM. And if they had a diagnosis of disseminated cancer, they'd have zero points on the NESM. Um, this was a little confusing to me uh, just because Seemingly anyone with, you know, the, the, the uh, NSQIP defines uh, disseminated cancers, any patient with a primary cancer that is metastasized to a major organ and meets at least one of the following criteria, namely that the patient received active treatment for cancer within one year of their ACS. Um, this is nice because if a patient's undergoing surgery for cancer, metastatic cancer, they're automatically considered to have disseminated cancer. Uh, conversely, uh, this was, uh, like I said, a little confusing because I would anticipate everyone to have disseminated cancer unless the bone is not a major organ system, which would be news to me um, and our orthopedic colleagues, certainly. Um, the reason I bring this up is, you know, this could potentially, this is not just theoretical, I think this could lead to a potential misclassification. For instance, if someone has a solitary bone metastasis from a, you know, uh, a non uh, breast, kidney, lymphoma, myeloma case, they might erroneously be given a NESM score of zero um, instead of the appropriate score of three, um, be a modified Bauer score of three and NESM score of two. Um, the other question I had sort of was ambulatory status. If you read the methodology of this paper, they say it's derived from the functional status um, section of SQIP. Um, this question asks, is classified based on uh, patients. Uh, it's more akin to a Karnofsky performance score. I, with regard to a patient's ability to perform activities day of living. Um, there's also a section for quadriplegia and paraplegia. Um, neither address walking status per se. Um, for instance, someone could be severely um, non-ambulatory despite not being paraparetic or paraplegic or quadriplegic. Um, conversely, you know, they could be functionally disabled but still capable of walking around. Um, nevertheless, uh, these, uh, Using this methodology, they are capable of identifying uh, on nearly 800 patients um, with you know, a wide range of factors, um, you know, sort of encompassing the, the full range of the Bauer score. Um, again, highlighting my question methodology, um, the patients with disseminated cancer, um, uh, the patients without disseminated cancer correspond to those with uh, a modified Bauer or spinal, spinal metastasis score of three. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so just keep moving along. Um, what they found when they validated this cohort was that um, mortality improved in a stepwise fashion um, compared to zero. So mortality was significantly higher in patients with a spinal metastasis score of zero at 30 days than um, in with those with higher scores. Same for major systemic complications, um, namely intubation, cardiac, VTE, death, et cetera. Um, Interestingly, complications um, appear to be broadly similar to the core, although there was a trend um, towards increase with each uh, increasing score. Uh, I'll skip over the, the logistic uh, analysis, uh, but basically the, the NESM score points are approximately 70% of the variation in mortality and complications in this model. Um, just to summarize quickly, uh, criticisms. Uh, I think this is a, a 
good attempt to validate a score using some creative uh, methodology in a large multi-center cohort, this large database. And I think it validates the NESM score using, um, when in my mind, is a slightly more you know, relevant uh, outcome, short-term complications, mortality, than one year, simple one-year survival. Um, the bad, I, again, the, the concern was whether this, this methodology they used to evaluate the NESM score was adequate. Um, you know, it's, it would be nice to see some sort of validation of this methodology to convert the, the NESM um, to this ASCAP. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, um, the ambulatory status is also a similar issue. I'd like to see some validation of that. Um, and then I said, like I said before, the selection criteria could allow for inclusion of non-oncologic uh, spine surgery. And then uh, just, you know, uh, this is more a philosophical thing, but the, the, the heart of the NESM score is the Bauer score, which is really a, a prognostic score based on cancer type and what, uh, extent of disease. Um, you know, it was developed in 1995. In 1995, we had pay phones. Trump was a, a bankrupt casino mogul, not, you know, the president of the United States. And Apple was bankrupt instead of a multi, multi-billion dollar company. Um, in 1995, cancer therapy, words like cancer kinase inhibitors, immunotherapy, and radiosurgery would have been exotic, if not non-existent for most spine surgeons and, frankly, most oncologists. So cancer surgery has undergone radical changes. Melanoma, for example, has gone from an incurable disease once you're metastatic in 1995 to one where you have a reasonable chance of making it to five years now. Um, so I think, you know, uh, given that this is sort of the beating heart of the NESM, I think that was um, sort of one concern with using the score more broadly. And finally, both this, the original valid paper and the validation, uh, were limited to patients who had already been selected to undergo surgery. So, you know, the question of whether this is valid in terms of applying to patients before they've gone to surgery, it, it's really not externally valid. It may be. But anyway, I'll go on. All right, perfect. Last but not least. Uh... Last but not least, uh, Cliff Pierre. He's going to show an illustrative case. Uh, thank you, Cliff, for putting this together. Not a problem. Great job. Cliff deserves credit for the orchestration. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Cliff Pierre, originally from Brooklyn, New York. I uh, completed medical school and started neurosurgery residency training at the University of Rochester, currently one of the spine fellows here at the Swedish Neuroscience Institute. Today, I'd like to present a case of a 72-year-old uh, female. She has a past medical history of diabetes. Uh, she presented to us from an outside ED with worsening severe low back pain that she had said uh, became progressively uh, debilitating for her over the past two months. She's a recent immigrant from Mexico, Spanish-speaking only. She noted that she had increased difficulty standing and ambulating for an extended period of time, had associated numbness in her buttocks and perineal uh, region. And what uh, was most significant was she had started to develop urinary retention as well as dysuria at the time. She denies any bowel dysfunction at the time, um, uh, also denies any neck pain or dexterity deficits. Uh, exam uh, um, during our initial consultation uh, was uh, noted for specifically bilateral low extremity weakness and numbness uh, in both, uh, uh, both legs. And the gait exam at the time was deferred, and due to strong cultural concerns, we deferred doing a rectal. However, with the history, we were able to get some descriptors that she started having significant um, uh, deficits in her lower sacral plexus. When she was transferred to our institution, uh, this is uh, her outside imaging, which, uh, again, I'm not sure why the um, uh, Images are flipped in that direction, but um, what you can see is extensive uh, expansile destruction of the uh, lower half of the L5 body with um, uh, uh, extending into the sacrum, uh, all of her S1 to S5 roots. And uh, again, this is just another uh, video capture of axial imaging of her MR lumbar spine. Um, again, significant expansion and destruction of a lesion uh, um, encompassing her uh, lower pelvis. Uh, these are still shots of the lesion itself. And um, again, we're just showing some CT of the bony anatomy. These are coronal and sagittal view, as well as uh, uh, axial view. Again, noting the destructive expanse of lesion in the sacrum. Um, the significant compromise of the uh, 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 sacral plexus uh, um, from the lesion itself. And uh, there were no other lesions anywhere else in her body. And so again, um, in our workup and plan, one thing we were able to uh, obtain was a, a CT-guided IR biopsy, which noted uh, um, plasma cytoma versus multiple myeloma uh, from the preliminary findings of the path. Uh, as discussed earlier, um, in the, um, throughout the day, we talked about different scores for neoplastic um, um, disease. Uh, we talked about the SINs, the NOMs, as well as most recently, Dr. Heyman talked about the New England spinal metastasis score and uh, some of the uh, reservations there. And so 
Before we talked about our surgical treatment, this is just to define scores applied to this patient. Uh, again, noting um, uh, increasing instability with neuro decline. She has multiple myeloma, which is a radiosensitive disease, but her SIN score of a nine puts her in that indeterminate uh, phase for which we uh, say would classify as unstable, um, and she would be able to tolerate surgery uh, based off of her systemic disease burden. And so going back, again, we discussed some of the options uh, for stabilization uh, based off of her neuro decline, um, which approach, as well as how many levels, and then um, with it being an expansive lesion in the sacrum, any considerations for preoperative embolization. And so our, this is, again, the, uh, the NEM score that Eric most uh, pointedly defined, that uh, the numbers don't add up because of the ceiling effect. So she scored a four on our scale because her preoperative albumin was a 4.2, um, uh, however, with the ceiling effect that the max would be a three for her. And our surgical treatment was we did a preoperative embolization, uh, subsequently followed by L3 to LM fixation with the multi-rod construct, um, and uh, did a nerve sparing technique uh, with the inferior L5 rectomy, and then we reconstructed her sacrum uh, with the transverse cage placing PMMA. And these are the post-operative films. And uh, how did we you do? Uh, we how have did a you? we have a post-operative follow-up of how she did uh, recovery, and uh, um, so we uh, most uh, recently examined her about four to five years out. Uh, she noted significant improvement in her pain. She has intermittent mild low back pain as well as lower extremity uh, pain, but she says it's much improved since her preoperative course. She remains fully functional. She doesn't use any assistive device to uh, to, to get around. Um, only notable uh, thing that remained was uh, her urinary incontinence at base. Line. She continues adjuvant maintenance therapy of chemo, uh, closely followed by her, her oncologist. Super. Can you stay there? Yes. So uh, let me ask uh, Dr. Lieberman. So you've been critical of some of my surgical managements, um, and that's perfectly fine. Maybe show that. As a systems chief, um, do you use scores? Do you insist that your surgeons uh, kind of document a, a, a kind of systemic, thoughtful approach towards looking at neoplastic patients? So kind of give us a big picture summary of what you've just seen. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity, Jens. And, and I'd never be critical of your surgical technique. Uh, we all do things a little bit different. Mm -hmm. uh, I am very indeterminate when I use my scores. Uh, in life, there are lumpers and there are splitters. Uh, a lot of the stuff that we are seeing is getting so granular that the overlap becomes uh, more confusing, as was pointed out in a couple of the, the talks right now, how one really doesn't go with the other. Yes. I think if you always go back to your basics, the indications for surgery are one, progressive neurologic deficit, two, spinal instability, three, unrelenting pain re resulting in loss of function. If you answer yes to each one of those three, that patient's getting an operation in my hands. I think you've shown some very difficult tumor cases. You've addressed them uh, very well. Uh, I think we do have new techniques now that you and I both know we've not had 10 years ago and 20 years ago. This is all stuff that's still evolving. I know what we were doing now 10 years ago uh, looked very barbaric, but I know 10 years from now, when we look back, we're going to say, boy, that was primitive. We, you know, we're doing this. And the oncologists are making so many advances with molecular immunology and targeted therapy and spinal radio surgery uh, that we're going to be changing this. And I suspect that our role as surgeons is going to be more delivering targeted therapy than actually reconstructing or decompressing the spine. Um, I'm going to ask Cliff again. Thank you so much for putting this together. Really good stuff. Sorry to shortchange your part here. You've seen three scoring systems and uh, three cases. What are you going to do as you're going on into an academic uh, teaching practice in the future? What are you going to have your service use? I think uh, just as Dr. Lieberman noted, um, again, uh, 
taking all the things in consideration. And once I get to consultation, as I think right now, I would, uh, again, pay attention to instability um, and then uh, focus on the noms, you know, as a comprehensive um, aspect of approach. I think that's the biggest thing that we were able to learn, the treatment algorithm for these patients and using some of the scores as something that can help, but again, you know, uh, tons of validation in terms of its prognostication would come from the NOMS score. That's, so that would, I, would, that, I would use that as my a guide in my practice. With that, we're out of time and over time, but thank you all for joining us and thanks Cliff and thank our you. fellows for putting this great program together. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.